to welcome Professor Avinash Kumar Agarwal, who has kindly volunteered to educate us, enlighten us, and show us the exciting path forward. Over to you, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you, Professor Harish, for a welcome. Let me make some amends to your remarks. I'm not here to educate. I'm not here to teach you anything. You are all my colleagues, very knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than me. I'm only here to discuss my own experience of two decades, over two decades in IIT Kanpur and securing extramural funding. And I also happen to sit on the other side of the table on many committees of different departments. So I also have the experience of what really the committee looks for. So I just thought that, you know, it will be nice if I share with my colleagues how to make an effective proposal and what the committee really expects so that our strike rate can increase. And before I go into the nitty gritties, I would just like to say that, you know, when I'm sitting on the other side of the table on some of these committees, I find that the proposals that are submitted by IIT Madras, IIT Kharagpur, IIT Bombay are much higher in number compared to what we submit from IIT Kanpur. Of course, our, our proposals are much more higher quality. That's why the success rates are very high for us compared to other IITs. But at the same time, the numbers are smaller. And going forward, if we can increase our number, obviously it will be good for our institute. My understanding is that IIT Kanpur, with the recent growth in number of faculty members, we have a potential to increase our extramural funding by at least three times in over next two, three years. Three times more, both in terms of number and, both in, and also in terms of the value of the proposals. And that's why I thought that it will be appropriate for me to talk to the younger most colleagues because they are the future of the institute. And I'm sure if you all take active steps, our institute will be soon in the race to become number one again and gain the former glory. We used to be number one in all the rankings earlier. Now we are at the bottom of the pile. So I will just be discussing about various funding opportunities that are available. And I will then focus on the SERB schemes that are going on. And currently the CRG call is also going on, which is the Submission date is 15th of March, so still there are about 10 days and you have enough time to build a proposal for SERB CRG. And then I'll talk specifically about the project proposal and then I will share some of my assessment of how do you secure funding and then I will share some of the links. And I don't want to make it a lecture. This is, please understand, this is not a lecture. This is only a sharing of the experiences, so please feel free to interrupt. And I would like it to be a dialogue, not a monologue. So please, I will really appreciate if you interrupt me and ask as many questions as you like before I move forward. So if you look at the funding opportunities, I have to compliment our Dean R&D, Professor Harish. We very regularly get a table of proposals, which was never there. He started it, it was his initiative. So at least, you know, we know where the funding opportunities are available. So I think a lot of work, many a times we are not able to submit the proposals because we don't know, we can't keep a tab on all the proposals that his office is doing a wonderful job and they tell us, you know, this proposal is on, you can submit this funding, that funding. At least it is very helpful to us, Professor Harish, so thank you very much for that. So I will just not put a whole collage, but I'll just put some funding agencies which may be of interest to some of you. SERB and DST are obviously the biggest of them. And then, you know, you have funding opportunities which are related to Department of Biotechnology. And there is a 
Yeah, those working in the area of renewable energy, there is a Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. Then there is Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, again for those who are working in some of these areas. Then there is funding available also from CSIR, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Then there is a GITA funding, Global Innovation and Technology Alliance. There is funding available from Indo-US Science and Technology Forum. They also fund a lot of networked projects, Indo-US projects and uh, and internship opportunities, uh, internship opportunities, visitation opportunities and so on. There is very good funding that is available which we have not made very good use that we should have made in this institute is Indo-French Center for Promotion of Advanced Research. This is one funding opportunity which gives up to 200,000 euros if you have a partner in France and this can be split 100,000 euro, 100,000 euro between two of two organizations and then there are industrial two plus two projects and so on. So this, I think there is a lot of potential for us to increase our presence in here. Then there is an Indo-German call for proposal, similarly, you know, similar to Indo-French, there is an Indo-German call for proposal. There is one uh, center called Center for High Technology, CHT. It's a ministry of uh, petroleum and natural gas and they fund large projects, which are five crores, 10 crores. And the only requirement there is that you should be working with one of the oil companies. They should be your partner and they should be willing to say, put in 50% of your of the money project funding. And then of course, DST happens to be our, one of our biggest funders. I'm sure DST and SERB constitute most of the projects then come to our institute. So this is just a, uh, uh, this is not complete list. I think the complete list uh, is sent every week by uh, Dean r and I'll shift my gears now to talk about uh, SERB schemes. If you go to SERB webpage, there are many, many schemes that are there in SERB. Again, this is not a very comprehensive list. There are many other uh, schemes which are not there. For example, the most important for young colleagues like uh, uh, of ours will be core research grant, also called CRG, and I'll talk more in detail about it. Then for colleagues who are very senior, 55, 60 years, who have accomplished everything and they don't want to write projects. There is a scheme called JC Boss, where there is assured funding for those who have accomplished everything. Uh, about 19 lakh rupees per year is given for five years, renewed if you are doing well, keep doing your work, again renewed for another five years and so on. There is a national postdoctoral fellowship, which is given to young students who are doing postdoc, and I think many of us benefit from this scheme uh, to a large extent. Then there is a supra scheme, scientific and useful profound research advancement. Again, here up to 80 lakh rupees grant can be provided or there are special calls where there's no limit actually, higher limit. And then there is a SERB power scheme. There is a high risk, high reward scheme. There is a international travel support. There is a technology translation award. In addition, there is a EMEQ, equal opportunities uh, scheme for uh, underrepresented sections of the society. There is a EMEQ for women. There is another scheme of SERB. Similarly, there is a scheme called SERB STAR. SERB STAR is a scheme where if you have done a project of SERB and it is ranked very highly, then you get assured funding of something like 10 lakh rupees for three years plus some token money of 15,000 for your pocket money. Uh, that's also given. So if you, have, if you are involved in a the SERB project already ongoing, try to get excellent funding and then possibly, I don't know whether it is applied, I think probably it is applied. I have just joined the committee for the SERB staff. Uh, so if you look at the project proposal, if you want to submit a project proposal for SERB, there are, these are the 10, 12 different headings in which the information is sought from you. The first proposal is title of the project. The second proposal is the summary which should outline briefly the scope of what you want to do and there is a limit. O online system will not allow you to exceed even one word. So you have to be very conservative with the amount of words that you are putting in. The objectives of the proposal, the teams of the investigators, then current status of development in the subject domain in which the proposal is written and then background, motivation, scope of the proposed technology development including relevant milestones already achieved and technology readiness level already achieved. I'll talk about TRL levels, some of you may not know about it. Then methodology the, that you will be following to achieve the objectives and then activity wise pro, uh, plan, how you're going to do it and the resource planning 
and then nature and evidence of the industry participating including the type and quantum of support and then of obviously you have to look at the budget which is year wise item wise with the breakup of the budget now when you write a proposal you have to start with the idea what idea you want to do it so basically the idea is central the whole idea is central and then you have to start writing the the proposal so when you start writing the proposal the components that are there for which you have to work on in order to achieve success is idea is central to the to the success what is the trl level trl is technology readiness level and i'll define technology readiness level is you start with the idea you start developing that idea you start doing research you write some projects papers your student does phd once it does phd and you have you you know that you have solved the problem and you you know everything about it you are still at trl 3 okay in university you can't achieve more than trl 3 now beyond trl is a scale of uh, 0 to 9 now when industry wants to take it industry wants to take it from trl 7 7 to 9 okay so 4 to 6 there is no ecosystem as of now in most government institutions most indian institutions so therefore you know most of the research and technology development that is done in our labs actually falls through the through the crack and it never gets commercialized in order to overcome this pro problem i think our current director our current dean r and d they have taken this initiative and we have set up something called research park techno park in this institute where the industry comes together our people go together with them and then they de develop the idea further so that it can go into the industry so anyway i'll talk about it a little later uh, then you you know the relevance of the idea that you want to do in the future industry partner whether there is any industry interested in the in the proposal or not and finally you have to write the proposal and then present it to the committee now in this whole chain these are the key elements everybody has good idea of course if we are writing a proposal we 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 know what is the status we have done some background work and we will write something what is what you are writing is extremely important because the reviewer does not know what is in your mind he, he sees the, what is on the paper so writing and presenting becomes extremely important and you have to also understand that when you are writing you are the subject expert suppose you are working in a very very niche area which is very narrow if you look at the committee that is reviewing in the committee there may not be a single expert in your area most of the experts that sit on the committee are mostly generalists with some niche areas and they take the decisions so when you write a proposal it is very very important that you write enough depth but you also give a bird's eye view you should also present your proposal in such a way that even if i am not an expert in your area i should be able to appreciate and i should be able to appreciate the idea and, and support it so writing and presenting it becomes the the central part of the proposal now what is the process and for the funding call and evaluation so first there is call for funding and then you have to generate the idea for research and then you submit the proposal and finally uh, it is submitted and then once you submit it then it goes for the evaluation to the expert committee and then it goes to the reviewer so please understand i will just give you the some of the numbers about the serb pac which i also happen to be a member so generally there are in mechanical engineering say there are about seven eight hundred 900 proposals in one call now finding 900 proposals is next to impossible 900 into 2 1800 proposals they are not enough experts in in india which for every proposal you will be able to find two experts so generally the way committees work is that first there is a screening so that means the committee sits and they bring down these 900 proposals they try to weed out the proposals which are not so effective so in first round lot of proposals are screened out which we know that you know they don't have potential or the pi does not have the competence or infrastructure or the objectives are un unreasonable and they cannot 
deliver anything successfully. So such proposals are screened out and then a sizably reduced number of the proposals are going to go to basically the reviewers which are outside the committee. Now those reviewers are going to do this on a voluntary basis. The reviewer at least two, I mean every proposal is sent to three, four reviewers with the expectation that at least one or two will get back and most proposals we get about one or two uh, uh, recommendations or, from, or reviews. And then the committee sits through them and then there are several ways in which uh, it is, it is uh, uh, basically uh, approved. There are some proposals which are very good and they are, they are accepted. There are some proposals for which people ask that you know, they should come and present in front of the committee and then the committee takes a call. So then th these presentations go over the next three, four days and it's a very taxing uh, job for the committee to sit through all the, all the presentations from 9 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the evening, three days at least. And so then finally the decisions are, are made and roughly, just to give you a number, roughly about 10 to 15 percent proposals of the initial submissions get funded. So this should give you idea that if you write at least four or five proposals, you can expect one to get approved. So do not get disappointed if you submit your first proposal and it gets rejected. You have to just keep trying. That's the only thing that I would like to say out of five, six proposals, four or five proposals, at least one will, will come. So which parameters would you like to express your idea? Uh, of course, uh, effectiveness of how you are writing the proposal is extremely important. Now, yes, yes. Yes. Does that stand as chances in the upcoming proposal? No. Nobody has that kind of memory. Nobody has that kind of memory. You only do not get the uh, chance to come back again if you have misbehaved with somebody. But for any professional reasons, there is absolutely uh, no possibility that any, anybody will remember that you submitted and your was rejected. So that's why we should not consider it again. No. So. You know, one of the main mistakes that we do as researcher is finding a title of the project. So when we write the title, we want to put everything in there. And it becomes like a title of a huge paper. Now when you are writing a title, title should be crisp. So one of the things that I would highly recommend is that the title should be small. It should tell the spirit. So it should be one line, it should be crisp sentence and it should indicate the spirit of the proposal as small as possible and it should tell just by looking at the proposal we should know what is inside the proposal and it should be crisp and this is where most of us actually struggle. So one has to be aware of this and it will be also very nice if you can also write uh, some kind of an acronym. For example, I submitted a Indo-French proposal just last week and we were discussing about producing gas you know, and enriching it in methane uh, from the agricultural biomass and using it in the engine. And we just gave one line so title and we also gave an acronym called AgriGas. Now this AgriGas becomes very catchy. So when you are writing the title, you know, uh, you have to be very creative. You have to capture the attention of the reviewer. Okay. If you have written, a, a, on an average, if a proposal is 50 page, right? And as I said, 900 to 1000 proposals. Who is going to read it? Who is going to read it? If you are in the committee, will you read it? Is it humanly possible? So if you want to have a higher success chances, you have to catch the attention of the reviewer. Whoever is looking, make it catchy. Then you know, then it comes to project summary. In the project summary, you should answer these four questions. What you are addressing, why you are addressing, how you are addressing and when you are addressing. When means how long. So these four uh, questions are extremely important and they have to be done in a very intelligent manner. Some of the other sub subsections is that you should really consider in writing project summary because projects are mostly, you know, reviewer is just going to read title and summary in the initial round 
and this is where you have to grab the attention of the reviewer and these four questions are extremely important as i said you know this will be like 2000 2500 word is the limit so in about 500 words you should tell what is the gap in the existing technology existing solution or whatever you are proposing gaps you have to identify then you know you have to also figure out you know how you propose to address that gap what you are and i'm i'm trying to keep it very uh, stream agnostic not trying to say only mechanical engineering or electrical engineering even somebody said maths i have to take care so this is also applicable to maths and basic sciences so you should try to look at it why you how why and how you are going to address this gap and how you would like to address this gap so why it is necessary to address this gap and how you would like to address this gap and in here you should bring your innovative ideas in. what you are doing which is different from others if you are addressing a gap which 100 other people have addressed and the expert will just look at it okay this this thing has been done by this person and the project is trashed so you have to bring innovativeness here into the picture and then you know you should tell when you will be able to uh, conclude this project and about 500 words please understand when you are writing the project it is very very important to define mission objective you know a project can have 10 different objectives i want to do this i want to do this i want to test this i want to write this i want to do this you can list it no problem but then you have to write one mission objective that mission objective is extremely important so that mission objective has to be defined about 200 250 character and this should be your starting point and then you can bullet other objectives and then when you write the objectives you have to use this smart approach which i will just tell you in the next slide and then you know you should also mention very clearly what is the task force for executing the the project so that means you should list all the members and you should also try to somehow express that this team is not competing with each other this is complemented to each other i have this expertise my colleague has this expertise and therefore two of us will deliver something which is very unique so this is also something that you have to keep in mind now the other important details are uh, you have to look at methods to be adopted to fulfill this project objectives flow chart of the project executive uh, strategy is important timelines are important and then you know the most important i would say is is there any industry interested now industry interest can be two types one is that industry is so much interested that they are saying boss i am putting 25 percent of the money on the table and i want to be your project project partner whatever technology you develop i will implement in my in, I, in my industry and I'll make a prototype that is the best way okay but you will find that you know industry seldom gives this kind of a commitment that they don't want to come up with the money and then they don't want to invest that much upfront until they see everything you know happening because when you are trying to do a project there are many things which are not on the table you are they are still in exploratory phase and until then industry is sometimes reluctant so even if the second even if they are reluctant what you can do is you can tell them that okay if you're not putting the money on the table fine but then at least give me a support letter that this is of interest to you and if there is any successful outcome i'll be willing to invest or make use of this technology that should be pretty easy because now the industry is not putting any money on the table they are saying that yes i'm interested this is a good area and i would like to partner even that kind of a support letter from industry if you get it increases your chances of success because now the committee and the SARB knows that whatever is being done whatever they are funding at least has some possibility of going into the market so if you can get an industry support letter even if it is without cost it will actually strengthen a lot of the success of your project so it should the industry support letter can mention you know what would be the strategy to be adopted by industry in bringing this pro product or project or technology to the market if they can put this in the letter it will it will increase your possibility and of course budget you know you have to do year wise item wise and with the breakup and then you know there is obviously you ask the institute you, you go to dean r and d sir and then say that give us a letter and then he writes a letter that we take the responsibility of financial management of the project 
Yes. No, any industry, startup is fine. Of course, I mean, if you if you if you get a letter from Tata Motors, this will carry more meaning compared to an incubator in IIT Kanpur. But even in a letter from incubator in IIT Kanpur will be valuable. It will be certainly much better than having no letter at all. So any industry does not give you a letter just like that. I mean, for that industry actually is the asset test for the technology that we do. Industry does not give just for the fun of it. They will evaluate everything, and only if it is worthy. Only then they give the industry letter. So if you can get a letter even from an incubating company or a, a mid-sized company, that means your technology or your product or your process has industry worth or industry worthiness. So coming back to the title of the project, you know, as I said, you know, it should summarily inform the entire project in in the in few words so just in few words it should tell you know what are the contents it should be catchy and it should reflect the main focus of the work and committee members uh, should be able to imagine what is written in the project just by looking at the title and if you if you catch your if the catch the attention of the committee member then they will look at the summary part and read it carefully and if they find it attractive enough they will flip through other pages otherwise the project will go off one of the mistakes that we do is we write the name of the equipment we write the name of the processes you know so please don't write name of the equipment any company name any area name etc in the in the project title keep it absolutely professional so <clears throat> obviously you have to you have to have a project title have one target one arrow kind of a thing and mission objective of the research should be reflected in the project title whatever is your mission objective that you have defined it should find some place in your title now coming to the project summary you know it again there are about 2000 word limit on it and so the project summary should reflect you know why you are doing this project and then it should also reflect the methodology that you are going to adopt in order to achieve the research objectives and what is the utility to the to the industry to the science and to the academics what is the utility of what you are doing and then there is a need and justification of the project that you have to write very clearly and then last and the most important is that you have to write the impact of the proposed technology whatever you are proposing how it is going to reduce the human effort how it is going to increase the quality of life ultimately that's the purpose of the technology development and science coming to the objectives objectives have to be smart so when you are writing the objectives you have to be very specific so it should tell you know how you will measure the outcome of the success of the proposal whatever objectives are there they should be measurable either qualitatively or quantitatively and they should be achievable you know you can say that within one year i will make anti gravity machine we know that it is not possible so it should be achievable and should be able to convince the committee that you are serious about it and then of course there is a relevance relevance you know the need of those measuring the objective it should be relevant to them and then it should be time bound every proposal should be time bound every activity should start on time and end on time so these are the smart objectives and you have when you write your specific objectives other than the mission objectives you have to make sure that you write it this way so that it becomes catchy to the to the reviewer and to whoever is going to review it now when it comes to team of the investigators of course the you have a pi which is the main leader of the project there is a co-PI, which is, I mean, you can have more than one co-PI. You can have co-PI from your institute, your department, outside the department, whoever. And then there could be other collaborators who, who will contribute to it. This could include your PhD students, your postdocs, and things like that. And you have to write their names and affiliations, etc., etc. But the important thing why I'm bringing it here is that this team, you know, should have complementary expertise. And once you look at the qualifications and affiliations and areas of these people, they should be able to uh, convince the evaluation committee that yes, put together this committee can collaborate and deliver on all the objectives that have been committed. So therefore, this composition of the committee is also very important. Now, <clears throat> there is one mistake that most of the time we do is, you know, in this, in writing this part, current status of the development in the subject domain in which the project technology present technology is being developed so one of the mistakes you know this is one area where 
I have seen horrible projects. And just by looking at it, we know that the PI does not understand what he's talking about. And then the project gets thrown out of the window. So these are the two status that is asked. You know, we have to write, you know, international status and national status. So people give actually, they will take 10 papers, they will write so and so at all did this, so and so at all did this, so and so at all did this, and they just write and that's all, they just get done with it. This is not how you should be writing uh, uh, international status or national status. First of all, if you are writing a project, you should do a serious search about what other academic institutions in the country have done, which not many people do. What other institutions in uh, outside India are doing. And then you should also do with the same rigor what the industry is doing. This I think I find always lacking, you know, the, when people write, they just don't make any effort to figure out what the industry is doing in this area. And then you have to build a small story. It should not be A did this, B did this, C did this. That doesn't cut any ice, it's very boring, I don't even read it. You have to write a story about the theme of the proposal, you know, how different uh, items in that have been done by different people and it should evolve like a story. So this, these two are extremely important. You have to be very specific when you are writing this, you have to be very specific to the problem. What things have, whatever has been done, you should even mention the minor details related to the project in these two. Okay, and don't write very superficial status that A did this, B did this. You have to go deeper and this is where actually you have to write the technical details good in reasonable depth. Okay, so this will actually uh, be very helpful to you. You have to write the background motivation and scope of the proposed technology development including relevant milestones already achieved and technology readiness level already achieved. Now I'll mention about what is technology readiness level. So first, of course, you have to write the motivation, okay, why you want to do this. And TRL levels, this is what I wanted to mention here. So this is a scale from 1 to 9. So TRL 1 means, you know, you are looking at only the basic principles. So this is where you actually start doing some research. You look at the basic principle observed and reported. TRL 2 is technology concept and application formulation. And TRL3 is analytical and experimental critical functions and characteristics proof of concept. Up to this, 1, 2, 3 is what is done in academic institutions. When a PhD student working on a technology submits his thesis after spending 4 years on that problem, you are still at TRL3. Okay? Because he is still doing everything in lab environment. Okay? Then, from TRL 4 to 6 is technology development and technology demonstration. And this technology demonstration is not in lab environment. This is more in industrial environment or semi-industrial environment. So here the component or breadboard validation in case of electrical circuit is done in laboratory environment. And component or breadboard validation in relevant environment. And then system, subsystem le uh, level relevant uh, um, demonstration in relevant environment. For example, if you are doing in space, then you are going to test your components on space. So TRL 4 to 6 is done in a ecosystem where you have academic partner coming from one side, industrial partner coming from other side, and both of them take the technology from, from the lab environment to the relevant environment in a gradual manner. Both become the process owner. So TRL 1 to 3 as academic institute, we are the process owner. TRL 7 to 9 is the industry, which is the process owner, we don't have any role. 1 to 3, they don't have any role. 4 to 6, both industry and academia have to work hand in hand and to increase the technology readiness level. So if you get a support from the industry, then the funding agency is convinced that you are not talking about 1 to 3, you will take it to a little bit higher level and then there will be possibility of taking it to market. But if you just do not demonstrate any uh, industrial support, then, then the, indust I mean the funding agency is reasonably convinced that you will, take, you will develop something, we will give you 1 crore rupees, after 3 years you will have a PhD, you will give us a 1 kilogram of Raddi report which will find dust in the office somewhere, right? It is not going to see the light of the day. I am sorry I am being little funny here, but that is the, um, the message is that if you have an industry 
partner at any stage interested, then you will be able to increase the TRL level of the outcome of your project. TRL 7 to 9 is what is done by the industry. So in TRL 7, you have a system, already the technology is proven. You will do a system prototype demonstration in relevant environment. And then you will do actual system development, flight qualified in case of space vehicles. So basically, 7 or 8 is, you know, I, I can put this in the context of mechanical system. So you have developed your product design, 7 or 8 will be like where you make all the dyes and other, other things. And 9 is where you make all the preparations to start the serial production. So beyond 9, you are in the market. So TRL 7 to 9 is actually done in the industry itself. Okay, so I hope any question on TRL levels? This is very important for us to understand it very clearly because this is where most of the projects either get funded or trashed. Not just here, but at any place. Yes. Again, are you suggesting that proposals with a TRL of 1, 2, 3 are likely not going to be funded? I am not suggesting that they are likely not going to be uh, funded, but if you have an industrial partner, then the uh, proposals are more likely to be funded. And basic, let me just clarify this, I think I understood what you are saying. Uh, there are schemes where basic research is also funded. And for example, in CRG, it is not necessary that you have an industry letter, support letter. So that means if you have a demonstration of TRL 1, 2, 3, it will still be funded. All I am saying is that if you have a proof or somebody saying that, okay, I am putting my money on it, or at least if you do something in this area, I will be interested in this. That means there is, a, there is a strong proof that the TRL level will be higher at the end, or there may be somebody who will be interested in putting money into taking TRL 4, 5, 6, 7, eventually to 9. That increases the possibility of success. No, I am nobody to speak on behalf of CRV, so that is the wrong question to me. But uh, the, you know, uh, it is there is no such decision that if there is no, uh, I mean, at least I have not heard that if the it's not getting going to get converted to product, you know, it will not be funded. So there is no such decision actually. Because there are other specific schemes for this, right? For four to six, for example, DBT, DST. No, no. They all have specific. Yeah. So, for example, DBT talks only about biotechnology. So they have technology development funds. <coughs> yes. Yes. This is about going from four to seven or nine. So I think I'm just concerned because you're. No, I think uh, you are right and uh, there are technology, there are schemes where which are specifically targeting TRL, higher TRL levels. But here what I am trying to say is that if even if you are submitting a CRG and you if you can show a potential that you know somebody is there who, can, who will be interested, the possibility of success will be higher. That's all. I have a question. Yes, please. No, of course you write the references. When you are writing this part, when you are writing this part, you have to provide the references. Because if you are writing international status, national status, you are looking at literature. So you have to write the references there. Yeah, so I think there is something where you upload the documents and in those uploaded documents you can make a section and then you can you can write it there. So don't waste your word limit on writing those just where you where there is an upload thing, there you put your references. There is a limit of uh, PDF file size, you can always make a low resolution and, and write it. Okay, so I think it's always a good idea when you write a project proposal, there are many, many activities that are written there. And many times, you know, in 90% of the project, we find that it is not very clearly specified. The, the activities are not very clearly laid out. So it is always a good idea to actually pr break your large projects into several work packages. And be very specific about work packages so that, you know, reviewers are able to see that this is planned very well. So, so you can break your activities into 5, 6, 7, 10 work packages, whatever you feel appropriate. 
So I think it is always a good idea to prepare a flow chart and then you know it actually details everything in my, all the micro steps in, in great detail and it really is helpful in understanding. And then once you break everything into work packages, you can also mention which team, who will be responsible for each work package. And this actually is quite strong in the sense that, you know, this helps the committee understand that this is really a collaborative work and the entire team will work like a cohesive team. So you can mention this here. So the, you have to define basically tangible and measurable deliverables, uh, deliverables by each stakeholder at the end of work package. One of the things that I forgot to mention here, and let me just cl clarify it, a picture talks more than 1,000 words. I find that, you know, people don't use so many pictures when they write pro proposals. So it's always a good idea if you can write your project proposal, like for example, when we submit our, our papers, we, we, we make something like a graphical abstract. And that looking at that graphical abstract, it gives us a good idea as to what we are varying and what parameters we are varying and what is coming out of the proposal. Something similar, infographics, if you can prepare for your proposal, the reviewer can just look at it and within one second or five seconds, he will know exactly what the project is talking about. And then he can make a quick judgment without, you know, loitering around here and there. And in a very crisp manner, he will know whether he likes your project or not. So it is always a good idea to use as much as possible infographics, uh, be a little innovative in making the infographics. That really helps you. Yes, sir. So basically, sometimes you like to say that this particular section, you have to put it in one page. Yes. So sometimes you are like putting that infographics as well as putting those texts uh, a bit like challenging. So like how to take care of that thing? Yeah, so as I said, you know, there are, when there are word limit, obviously you cannot put any infographic. But you can put a reference and then there are upload options also. So when you upload, you can make those infographics and then when the reviewer is looking at it, they always go through, flip through everything. And if there's a figure which is showing what the project talks about, it really catches their attention. You have to basically be innovative in, in writing the proposal to catch the attention of this. Yes, please. Is OPI mandatory in this thing or is it? Most of the scheme COPI is preferred because you know people do move, and SERB also likes to be in a position where if the PI moves, changes the job, the project is not gone down the drain. So COPI in that case becomes the PI. So it's always a good idea to have a COPI, and I think uh, at times our DNRD office also mandates use of COPI to be on the safe side. Correct, sir? No? So, but SERB prefers to have a copy. Obviously, you have to make a activity chart, so whatever timeline you define, you have to actually make your, after the work package, you have to define the activities, and you have to make a, a chart to show, you know, which activity is going to take whatever time and some data analysis and project report writing activity. I think all of us who have submitted, everybody has to make this kind of a chart. Uh, nature and evidence of industry participation is extremely important. They, the letter that they provide should indicate, you know, what is the type and what is the quantum of support that they are going to provide. So it is the most essential requirement. Nowadays, the government is increasingly becoming uh, of this view that industry participation is encouraged and the day is not far when they will say that it is mandatory the way it is moving over the last 15 20 years and therefore you know i would like to strongly encourage all of you to start doing projects at least you know even if you are doing a fundamental work get some industry to say that i am interested at the end uh, ultimately you know they are of the government is of the view that research should become commercially available to the society it's ultimately the taxpayers money and industry academic collaboration is encouraged by the institute, by the, uh, by the government. And then if in case your goal is that you are just asking for creating a lab facility or just for writing papers which are nobody is going to read or at the end submit one kilogram of Raddi report which nobody is going to read, then for sure you will not get the project. So you have to be very, very clear that in any way, none of these should be even 
reflected in your project proposal. Everybody nowadays needs money to build a project. I wrote projects and this is a reasonable expectation that if I write a project, I get equipment, my students work. Institute funding is getting shrinking and you know, you have to bring your own money. And we all write project grants to get the equipment. But it should not be very, very obvious that we are only interested in bring, bringing the equipment. Equipment as a, as a side, side, side benefit that you are getting. You should focus on the problem. Many times we, we get proposals where it's very clear that this guy is not trying to deliver anything. He's just trying to buy 10 equipment, do some mundane things and, and say it's a project. So one has to be very careful about it. Sometimes, you know, mistakes do happen. Sometimes such projects also get funded, but, but then, you know, for, you have to be extremely lucky to be successful. If you write a table like this, you know, you have to write when you write a project proposal, you have to basically make a budgeting of two years, three years. You have to write, you know, permanent equipment, manpower, consumable contingency, travel, and you have to justify everything. Please make sure that all the equipment, which is extremely essential, should be asked in the first year. And don't ask anything in the second or third year for two reasons. One is that in the first year, I mean, it takes nowadays a long time to procure the equipment. The standing process, this process, that process, it takes about six months just when you start working for the equipment to come. So you should do it always in the first year. So that when the project starts, it should be available for you in the second year to do your research. So please check the list of equipment available in your institute. Don't ask. I will not say don't ask, but avoid asking for the equipment which is already available in another lab in your institute. And if you just want to create a facility for yourself in your own lab, which is also, I mean, tens of them are available, it doesn't look good and it always gets cut and gives a very bad impression. So if, even if you are doing it and if it is genuine, you have to package it very differently. So ultimately, you know, funding comes from the taxpayer's money. And if you ask for the same equipment, then it's a sort of waste of taxpayers' money. And it also shows that you cannot collaborate with others in, in your institute. So you have to be very careful in, in this. Uh, of course, there are budget details you have to write, you know, budget details, manpower, travel. This is just a details you have to provide. And, you know, when you write a project, it is also important that you know, many times, many of the problems do not last three years. They, you have to solve it. They may take six years, eight years of, of uh, effort. Three years, you may not be able to sell, solve them. So it is important that you also sort of unfold the next phase of development. That I have done this, and then the next outcome will be this. So if you've done one project where you have brought it to a certain level, and you want to go and take it to the next level, it becomes very easy for the funding agency to give you for the next level. So always try to bring a linkage with the next phase of development. So you've got one crore now, you do something, I've done this, now I want to go to the next level and funding agency will happily give you the next, next project. And then, you know, if industry is interested in your project, then you should also mention that if industry is interested, how you're going to transfer the technology. That should also be laid out. So you have to basically also somewhere say a very, very clear roadmap for commercialization that if I have developed a technology, if I have developed a product, how I'm going to take it to the market. So if something like that can also be mentioned in the project, it always strengthens the project. Uh, well, I have now come to the end. These are some of the links uh, of different funding agencies. I'll maybe request Dean Arundi sir to circulate these. To you, uh, I think that's all from my side. If there are any questions, you know, I'll be happy to take. Yeah. Yes, please. Maths? Are you from maths? Uh, okay. management. management. There are many schemes from management also, and there are now there are maths related projects also being funded, two lakh, three lakh, you know. So there are funding agencies uh, 
uh, that are available and I think basics remain the same. If you make an infographic for management related projects, it's very easy to understand what you are uh, going to say. So I, I think the basics remain pretty much the same. This is, as I said, this is field agnostic. Yes, please. Uh, can you please comment on how the existing or just finished project affect the next one? It does. It does big time. Yeah, important. It does. Because, you know, if you write your project on the step that, okay, I have done this, I have done the TRL 2, I want to take it to TRL 3, or I have industry support letter, I take it to TRL 4, and the review committee says that, okay, yes, this is a successful project. Maybe they will dig the report, how you did, and if it is excellent or good, they will give you the next project very easily. Then, uh, then I would say that you don't give reference. If it is failed project, then you don't give reference that I have failed. <laughs> and uh, you, uh, well, who checks the record? So it's okay. I mean, you package it like a new project. Yeah, I also have one more query on the creating lab facilities. Yes. So you mentioned if you ask an equipment, so there is a chance that you won't. I mean, the viewers think that probably like he's a. Uh, without having those instrumentation techniques in a personal lab, how can you actually develop science? I am sorry, you misunderstood. I am not saying that you don't ask equipment. Project, all of us write projects to get equipment. It should not be explicit that we are developing the projects. In my lab, each and every project equipment has come from one project or the other project, most of them. So, Ultimately, the, if you have to do a research, you need equipment. A funding agency also knows it. But don't make it explicit that I am just doing it for building my lab. Of course, lab building always takes place. But you are solving a problem. In, for solving that problem, you need some equipment. And once the project is over, that becomes your property. I mean, your institute's property. And then you can use it for other purposes. So don't be, I mean, you have to, you have to not be very explicit about it. It should not look like, you know, you are trying to build your lab and that's why you are writing equipment. It should look like this equipment is essential. You have to justify that this is important for solving this problem and that is why this equipment must be given and the funding agency will be happy to give all the necessary equipment. If, if, the, if the proposed proposal is not able to get finished within the supplicate period, will be able to request some more funding? Uh, yeah, so there are two parts to this question. One is that if you want to do it at next level, then you write a new project and say that this is what I have done. But if you are not able to achieve your objectives first in the first project, then you can seek an extension. Three to six months extensions are given very routinely. But if you say that I also need money, it's possible to get money, but it's a very bureaucratic process. So whenever I'm not able to get, achieve any objective, I have never asked for money. I said, just give me no cost extension for three months or six months. That's very easy for the project manager to, I mean, the scheme manager to give you a no cost extension. They give you, the letter comes, Dean r and office extends the project, you complete the project. See, you have taken a contract to solve a problem in one crore. Now, you, because of some reason, you are not able to solve the project. And you say, give me one year and give me 20 lakh rupees extra. So that is like changing the rules of the game in the middle of the game, right? So nobody likes it. So you say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not able to do it. I need a little bit more time. Don't give me extra money, I'll commit. I'll do it in whatever money you have, we have agreed. So they will be happy to give you. Uh, I'm focused towards the, I know, the topic that we do, COVID. Yeah, so COVID, you know, all, every project was affected. So whoever asked for six months extension, I think without any uh, problem, everybody got six months extension. One year extension in many cases. I got extension without m any extra money. I mean, if, had I insisted, they would have given six months extra salary because we were supposed to pay salary and the, the people did not work. But I did not insist, so it was okay. Yes, please. Yes. I think I can just speak here. Can you uh, clarify or comment a little on what happens during the review of a project and how it is evaluated and how that can potentially influence the outcome of a second project submission? So, for example, during the review, I get a good or a very good or a reception is rather some star rating. 
uh, you are talking about project completion evaluation, right? So how does, how can that influence my second submission? No, normally not, because he, uh, uh, if it is, if it is very bad, only then it is remembered. If it is excellent, they will probably remember. But if it is good or very good, they will probably not remember. So, so I think if you don't do anything which makes you very special and catchy, I think it will not affect either way. Because many times, you know, many people submit second project, third project. We never discuss, at least I have not seen the previous project until unless somebody has done an excellent job and the program manager tells this. This guy did an excellent job and his star rating and this and that. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Is there a number for budget? So, yeah, that's a very important question. I must answer this question. So, SERB generally says 80 lakhs. Okay? And if it is more than 80 lakhs, I think you can switch off that camera. Switch off the camera, please. Switch off the mic. Camera, camera. One of the mistakes which even the senior seasoned professors do is that they want in a 10 minute presentation slot they put 30 slides 40 slides so i think one of the things that we always teach and we should practice is one minute per slide rule if it is 10 minutes are given you should not make more than 10 12 slides because what happens is then you are just flipping and it disturbs the concentration you are not able to make effective presentation so one of the things that I would like to, and I can say so because I can see that I am one of the senior ones here, along with Professor Harish, is that, you know, we should always have this ability and we should try to inculcate it to our students also, what you call as elevator pitch presentation. If somebody has to present his thesis in 30 seconds, he should be able to do it. If somebody is asked to make his thesis presentation in three minutes, he should be able to do it. 10 minutes, he should be able to do it. 10 hours, he should be able to do it. So this presenting the whole idea in whatever time is given to you, that is something that we have to inculcate in our students and also we have to learn ourselves. That is a very important art. But this is what makes or breaks the presentation. As I said, you know, what you are writing, that is one part based on which your proposal will move up and then finally you will kill it by presenting it properly. So both are equally important. And when you are presenting it, please understand from your point of view, you say that, you know, are time nahi diya hume. we are like 15 minutes we should be given, 20 minutes we should be given. But you look at the poor fellow who is sitting on the other side, 10 people, morning 9 o'clock to 7 o'clock, they have to listen to like 30, 40 people every day, listening and questioning, making the, uh, keeping themselves focused is very challenging task. So if the time that is given to you is 10 minutes, we should make the discipline of 10, 10 minutes. And that is where many of us actually struggle. So this is one area that we should work on. Okay, so if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Uh, my email is akag at ITK. I sit in 39, 339 in faculty building. If you have any questions, you can drop by any time. Thank you very much. As I said, I'm going to take back what he said. I still stick to my words. But yes, we learned, we got educated, and it was very entertaining. Thank you all. Thank you.